Good morning, everyone. I'm City Councilmember Richie Torres. I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. Uh, I will make a few preliminary observations and then we'll uh, hand, hand it over to the Commissioner. Uh, the subject of today's hearing is background investigations. As many of you know, the city has a backlog of 5,600 cases, uh, which is not only an embarrassment, but it is a threat to the integrity of city government. And we are reminded, we were reminded of what is at stake uh, with the case of David Hay, who despite serving as a deputy chief of staff in the largest agency in city government, never underwent a background investigation. Now it's important to point out that DOI has made considerable progress toward reducing the pre-existing backlog. Uh, it was over, well over 6,000 uh, when the new commissioner assumed office. And there's been real progress toward preventing the emergence of a backlog in the future. Uh, what worries me is the proposed timetable for clearing the backlog, 36 months to 48 months, strikes me as unacceptably long and unacceptable to most New Yorkers. Um, I think we can do better and we should do better. And so what I wanna hear from DOI is a diagnosis of what went wrong. Why was the background investigation unit allowed to atrophy from neglect? Because it's important to note that the backlog is not an accident. It was a consequence of neglect, a consequence of a lack of resources and a lack of prioritization. And then we want to hear DOI's plan for expeditiously clearing the backlog, uh, not only for the present, but also for the future as well. So with that said, um, Commissioner Garnett, can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth in your testimony before the City Council and in response to City Council member questions? Thank you. First, I want to thank the Council for their assistance and support in this area. Last year, during DOI's budget testimony, I outlined the serious backlog in background investigations that I became aware of shortly after taking office as Commissioner. As part of the effort to tackle this issue, DOI provided a plan of action and asked this committee to help DOI secure 13 extra personnel lines with funding for 10 of those lines at an estimated cost of $690,000. As a demonstration of my commitment to addressing this serious issue, DOI self-funded the remaining three positions at a cost of approximately $180,000. We received that vital support from this committee and from the city, for which we are especially grateful. We have filled all 13 of those positions and I am confident that the increased resources will be put to good use. Even before the new personnel began working, other steps we have taken have reduced the backlog by more than 1,350 applications over the last seven and a half months. I want to commend the team of DOI investigators and supervisors who have been working diligently to accomplish this. Background investigations are one part of a complement of services that, city, that DOI provides to the city that I view as an essential part of the agency's core mission. Along with the unit that receives and assesses complaints, and the unit that conducts background checks of city vendors with contracts valued at more than $250,000. Background investigations for sensitive city positions are part of DOI's frontline anti-corruption work. I have made it a priority to restructure the backgrounds investigation unit, reduce the backlog, and ensure that we are maintaining the highest standards of integrity in the process. This past year has put us on the right track to accomplish that. DOI conducts its background investigations per the mandate under Executive Order 16, which currently applies to a limited subset of city employees, specifically employees, quote, to be appointed to or holding positions of responsibility, end quote. In an effort to ensure that all such employees receive a background investigation, the DOI commissioner historically has defined certain more specific categories of employees who must have a background investigation. The last update to these categories was made in 2016, and as part of our overall review of the background investigation process, we are currently evaluating the suitability of the existing categories. I expect to make some adjustments to them, which I believe will result in a modest reduction in the significant amount of background requests that DOI regularly receives. 
without diminishing the effectiveness of our anti-corruption efforts. I will outline the details on those reforms shortly. DOI's background investigations gather the facts regarding issues like tax compliance, previous arrests or convictions, the truthfulness of a candidate's claimed work history and educational background, potential conflicts of interest, and where legally appropriate financial vulnerabilities that could make a candidate particularly susceptible to bribery or extortion. The focus of a DOI background investigation is to identify adverse information that could bear on the suitability of a candidate to hold a position of public trust. Where adverse information is identified, we share those facts with the hiring agency. Ultimately, it is the hiring agency who decides whether the information merits rescinding a job offer or terminating the employee. DOI background investigations enhance a hiring agency's internal hiring process, but they do not supplant it, meaning the hiring agency can and should be conducting its own pre-employment review that may include reference checks or requiring other information from a candidate. In all background investigations, city hiring agencies initiate the process by notifying DOI of the individuals at their agency who should be background checked. A full DOI background investigation typically takes several months to complete. The vast majority of backgrounds DOI conducts are completed after the applicant begins working in their city position. We expedite certain high-level positions so that the background can be completed prior to appointment. For example, commissioner-level positions, judicial appointments, and at the request of an agency head, certain highly sensitive positions. DOI's guidelines allow eight city agencies up to 30 days from appointment or promotion to forward a completed background package to DOI. Ultimately, hiring agencies and not DOI make the decision regarding whether to wait for the outcome of a background investigation before allowing an employee to begin working. Similarly, the hiring agency, as the employer, remains responsible for standard reference checks and other best practices surrounding hiring, particularly if they allow employees to begin working prior to their DOI background check being completed. Given the volume of applicants, it would not be feasible to conduct and complete all background investigations prior to commencement of employment for all employees subject to a background investigation. These realities are why I was particularly troubled by the scope of the backlog in DOI's background investigations, and why, as I will explain shortly, we have moved quickly to implement our goal of completing all new background investigations in six months or less. In the early summer of 2019, we divided the background investigation unit into two teams. One team represents a fresh start on our background investigation role, ensuring that going forward we are meeting our obligations to city agencies in a timely manner and not adding to the existing backlog. That team operates with the goal of completing all new background investigations in less than six months with an average time to completion of less than 120 days. I'm proud to say the staff on this team has kept us on track with these goals, completing 766 background investigations since July 1st of last year in an average of 71 days. A second team is dedicated to addressing and processing the background investigations that are part of DOI's backlog, with a goal of reducing the backlog to zero as quickly as possible without sacrificing quality. Since July 1st of last year, DOI has closed 1,357 applicant files from the backlog, reducing the backlog by approximately 20%, from approximately 6,479 on July 1, to 5,122 as of last Friday, February 21st. DOI continues to devote additional resources to background investigations through a rotation of incoming staff and other proactive measures. In addition, the influx of new investigative staff in this year's budget should continue to have a positive effect on these results. I believe we are on course to meet the goal that we discussed with the City Council last year, clearing the massive backlog within the next four years, if not much sooner. As I mentioned earlier, DOI is considering changes to the categories of employees eligible for a background investigation, which would reduce the pipeline of background applicants while ensuring that our background investigation resources are focused on those employees with significant decision-making or policy-setting authority, or those with positions that make them particularly vulnerable to corruption. I believe these revisions will advance our efforts to conduct background investigations in a timely manner without creating undue risks in the background process. I want to stress that even with the changes I'm about to outline, if a hiring agency requests a background investigation that it believes is in the public interest, DOI will honor that request. 
We will maintain our current balance of some objective triggers for background investigations and some subjective triggers for background investigations. We believe this balance between objective categories, which are easy for agencies to apply and provide a measure that is possible for DOI to audit and spot check, and subjective categories, which are targeted to the actual duties of an employee and allow for the variety of titles and structures across the huge range of city agencies is the best way to capture the universe of city employees who should be subject to a background investigation. The first objective threshold is salary, and it's currently set at $100,000 a year. After discussion with our experienced supervisors in the background unit, we've concluded that this threshold can safely be raised to an annual salary of $125,000 or more. Currently, that threshold applies even if a longtime city employee crosses it solely because of cost of living increases. We will make clear that the salary threshold for a background investigation for existing city employees is triggered by an increase in salary only if the raise is occasioned by a change in duties, title, or responsibility. The second objective category currently is any employee whose civil service title has an M code for managerial. We intend to raise that threshold to those managers who are in titles categorized as management level four or above, which mirrors the standard used by the city's conflicts of interest board to determine who is required to file an annual financial disclosure report. We will maintain the existing subjective categories while updating the language used to describe those categories. Those categories are one, employees with the authority to enter into financial transactions or agreements on the city's behalf valued at more than $10,000. Two, employees with the authority to negotiate or approve contracts of various kinds, applications for zoning provisions or special permits. Three, employees with administrator level access to the city's sensitive IT infrastructure and systems. And four, any employee whom the mayor or an agency head believes should be backgrounded in the public interest. When these changes are implemented, DOI will conduct outreach sessions for human resource professionals at city hiring agencies to walk them through the changes and provide an opportunity to share questions, concerns, and ideas. We will continue to evaluate the effectiveness of these categories and make further adjustments if warranted. Finally, DOI continues to actively review other options for responsibly reducing the backlog while also providing a level of service on current background investigations that meets our own high standards for professionalism and excellence. The guiding principle in evaluating any new idea is to maintain and foster the integrity of the background investigation process. I'd like to turn now to a background matter that was raised just before New Year's regarding David Hay a now former DOE official who had been arrested and charged in Wisconsin with the online sexual solicitation of a minor and whose background investigation was part of the approximately 6,000 backlog background files I inherited when I arrived at DOI. The process for DOE backgrounds is a bit different from the other background investigations that DOI conducts. Specifically, DOI does not fingerprint DOE employees or conduct a criminal history check. Rather, DOE performs those two assessments for its own employees. State education law and city regulations require DOE employees to be fingerprinted prior to beginning their employment. Additionally, due to the sensitive nature of the positions, DOE requires immediate notification of all arrests so that they can evaluate whether an employee poses a danger in their position. Accordingly, DOE fingerprints their own employees and receives those arrest notifications directly. For those DOE employees who are also subject to a DOI background check, DOI focuses on the other relevant information, such as financial background where applicable, tax information, and prior employment information, among other things. When Mr. Hayes' matter first came to light, it was unclear whether a completed background investigation would have revealed information relevant to the charges against him. However, an investigation by the Special Commissioner of Investigation, which oversees DOE matters, has provided additional detail on this matter. Specifically, the SCI investigation found that Mr. Hay misrepresented key facts in his background investigation questionnaire to DOI and to DOE, that the criminal history check conducted by DOE prior to his employment did not reveal any criminal charges or convictions against him, that no information relevant to his current criminal charges existed in any of the information sources that a DOI background investigation would have reviewed, and finally, that due to a non-disclosure agreement with a prior employer, other derogatory information about Mr. Hay would likely not have been shared with either DOE or DOI in any event. 
The fact that this background file was part of DOI's backlog remains a concern for me. But in this specific case, there is no reason to conclude that a completed background investigation would have uncovered prior misconduct or any facts related to the current pending charges against Mr. Hay. Mr. Hay's circumstances illustrate the challenges for any background investigation process. Although I believe that DOI's background investigations are thorough and our investigators are diligent and talented, no system is a perfect screen, nor can it be. If an individual does not have a criminal history or public record footprint of wrongdoing, if an applicant deliberately hides relevant facts from a hiring agency or from DOI, if prior employers refrain from sharing serious issues about an individual, the task of performing a complete background investigation is made immeasurably harder. As I mentioned earlier, DOI is continuously evaluating our background process to see if there are other areas open to improvements. We assessed the Hay situation to see if it illuminated any broader issues that needed to be addressed. As part of that review, we identified all backgrounds pending in the backlog that related to an assistant commissioner level position or higher and have moved those backgrounds to the front of the line. Other than this small adjustment, our top priority remains working through the backlog from oldest to newest as expeditiously as possible, consistent with our standards of professionalism and excellence. At the same time, the changes we have made to the deployment of the unit's resources should ensure that a long delay like that in the Hay situation will not recur. And to the extent any adverse information is discoverable with reasonable diligence, it is shared with hiring agencies within six months. In closing, I remain confident that the changes we've implemented over the past year within the background investigation unit are effective steps towards tackling and eliminating the backlog and meeting our obligations for the current background investigations entrusted to us. But we are not resting on the successes we have had so far. I recognize what is at stake and share the concern that incomplete backgrounds pose risks for New York City. I want to assure this committee and the public that DOI is successfully shrinking the massive backlog that had been growing for years and remains committed to eliminating it within four years, if not much sooner. This issue is among my top priorities. Thank you for your time today and for the opportunity to present this relevant and important information to this committee. I'm happy to answer any questions that council members have for me on this matter. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, I want to start with Mr. Hay. Um, th the press coverage has given the impression that he never underwent a background check but your testimony seems to suggest otherwise. So if, if you can clarify just the conflicting information. Sure, I, I think that uh, sometimes, uh, perhaps understandably in the press, there's a conflation between the different things that a hiring agency does versus the things that DOI does. And in the case of the Department of Education, unlike other agencies yeah. in the city, for DOE, um, because of state rules and the city's laws, DOE fingerprints their own employees and runs a criminal history check based on those fingerprints before they begin working. So in Mr. Hayes' case, the Department of Education had fingerprinted him and run a criminal history check which revealed no prior arrests or convictions. So that portion was completed prior to him. Did he undergo a DOI background check? So the, he, he had, uh, DOI received a file for him when he was promoted to Deputy Chief of Staff in the late summer of 2017. Um, and some preliminary steps had been taken on that file, mainly focused on tax compliance, his tax, tax filing status had been ordered, but none of the other steps had been completed. His file was in the backlog. So he had a partial, so, so I would say a partial check. So the DOE did submit his name for a background investigation? Yes, they did. But DOI failed to complete the background investigation? That's correct. Okay. Um, and what was the, what were the, triggers that led him to be, to undergo, which, which criteria did he meet, objective criteria did he meet for a background investigation? So he definitely was over the salary threshold and I believe probably also the managerial threshold as well. You referenced an SCI report, is that report public? So I know they've completed the report and are okay. sharing it with DOE I believe today and expect to make it public this week. Okay. Um, and you referenced a non-disclosure agreement? That's right, so um, some of this has been reported in the press. Mr. Hay was dismissed or he, would, he resigned upon being told that he would be dismissed from a principal's position at the Kettle Moraine School District in Wisconsin. The basis for that was not any allegations of sexual misconduct, it appears, but rather 
that he had uh, failed to comply with Wisconsin's licensing requirements yeah. for administrators, as well as some misuse of a district credit card for personal purposes. So he was informed of those charges, uh, told that he would have a hearing before the school board, which is the way that um, dismissal of education employees works in Wisconsin. Um, and he elected to resign prior to that hearing. Um, and in connection with that, the, he and the school district had an agreement, um, a, a type of non-disclosure agreement, that said he was resigning and forfeiting his right to a hearing. And in exchange, the school district would in future confirm his title and dates of employment and salary and, and would provide no other derogatory information about him. How do we know that he had a non-disclosure agreement? Was that the result of DOI's background check or DOE's in, background check? Or? No, in the course of SCI's investigation, they've spoken to the officials at the school district in Wisconsin, as well as um, submitted a, the equivalent of a New York State FOIL request for those records. So if, if DOI had completed its background check, would DOI had made outreach to those same employers? Um, so in all likelihood, we would have not directly spoken to the employer at Kettle Moraine because Typically, although DOI requests information about employers going back 10 years, um, the normal direct contact, sort of human to human contact, goes back, our standard is five years, and unless something- And how far back does that employment date? So that would be prior, the Kettle Moraine employment, I believe that Mr. Hay left there in 2011. So even if the background check had been done immediately upon receiving his file, that was in 2017. In all likelihood, no one would have directly contacted Kettle Moraine. But even if they had, because of some, you know, some bad feeling about the other information, um, what's clear from SCI's inquiry is that the school district would not have provided anything other than his dates of employment and his title. But the, the district would have confirmed the NDA? No. 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 The only information that they would have provided is the dates of employment, his title, and salary. But in the course of the latest investigation, SCI did, uh, did find out from the school district that he didn't have an SNDA? That's right, and in part, they, ma they made a FOIL request for the relevant documents. And I guess when you, when you discover that a prospective employee has an NDA, is that, is that a red flag for DOI? Yes, if, if we yeah. knew that, in, that an employee had left a previous employment with some kind of non-disclosure agreement, at a minimum, we would go back to the applicant and ask them, hey, you know, also they're supposed to report that on the background investigation questionnaire, that if they have left a prior employment upon being told there were allegations or that they were under investigation. Does, does, does your questionnaire specifically inquire about NDAs? Uh, no, it does not. Should it inquire about NDAs? Maybe, we are, uh, we're always evaluating the questions and I think we have, a, in the current background investigation questionnaire, there's a very thorough series of questions about um, whether you've ever been told you were under investigation or had allegations against you in connection with a prior employment, um, which should capture, regardless of the nature of the agreement that led to your departing that employment, if you, so the questions are designed to capture the full range of situations. They don't now specifically ask about a non-disclosure agreement. Um, it's a little bit complicated because those agreements vary tremendously um, in terms of, at times, including a provision that neither party will reveal the existence of the agreement. So what we have chosen to do is to ask directly about the circumstances of a person's departure from employment um, because we don't, we want to create situations that are designed to incentivize people to be truthful. Um, and so it's given the range of agreements and contractual yeah. obligations. We have it just seems to me an uh, NDA is intended to conceal adverse information. That's, and, yes. And, and I certainly would want to know whether a prospective employee, especially for a deputy chief of staff for the largest of the agency, is the subject of an NDA. That seems to be pertinent information for an agency to both ask for and know. You know, I think individual agencies could make that decision. I think from DOI's perspective, given the, as I said, given the contractual, varying contractual provisions of those agreements and the fact that. But, but why should we subordinate what's best for the 
for the integrity of our government to those contractual agreements. We have a right to ask as a condition of employment whether a prospective hire has an NDA. Yeah, I'd have to give that some more thought. I'm not sure that I agree with that. Okay. What are, what, I guess, why do you disagree? And if you, if you don't, if you want to think about it some more, that's. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think about okay. it more. I mean, I certainly understand the concern. Yeah. As I said, I think we, we have focused on questions that cover the actual factual circumstances of departure from prior employment um, that we think are broad enough to capture the full range without potentially putting someone in a position of having to violate a previous contractual agreement. I just want to acknowledge that Councilmember Kalos and Councilmember Yeager have joined us. Um, you, you noted in your testimony that Mr. Hay had misrepresented facts. Um, That's right. Uh, what facts did he misrepresent? The circumstances of his departure from the Kettle Moraine School District. Okay, and what specifically did he misrepresent to him? Um, well, he, in a series of questions both on DOE's uh, applicant forms as well as his DOI background investigation. There's a series of questions like the questions I've been referring to about that ask sort of in every possible way about the circumstances of departure from previous employment, including whether regardless of if it, if it resulted in a termination or resignation, whether you've ever been um, told that you are under investigation in connection with a previous employment or that there are charges against you or disciplinary action, and he responded in the negative for all of those questions, which was not truthful. And when you fill out a DOI questionnaire, and I'm assuming he misrepresented the facts in the, in the context of a DOI questionnaire, is that, yes. is, is, that a, is that a document that's submitted under oath? Yes, you submit the document under penalty of perjury as well as um, having a notary um, notarize the document where you have signed under penalty of perjury. So in your opinion, did he commit perjury? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kevin O'Brien, the former chief of staff for City Hall, uh, had substantiated allegations of sexual misconduct a mere month before his hire. Uh, does DOI inquire if a prospective employee has substantiated allegations of sexual misconduct? So we don't typically ask that specific question unless we have information that suggests that there might be such a thing. Um, generally speaking, our investigators, when they speak to prior employers, confirm that they, based on the information provided by the applicant, they confirm the dates of employment, the title, any other information about the employment, and we ask every prior employer whether they're, uh, the circumstances of the person's departure, and whether the employer is aware of any adverse information um, arising out of the person's employment. In the case of Mr. O'Brien, um, our investigators were told that he had resigned for a new opportunity in New York City, and that they were not aware of any adverse information about him. Why not ask specifically, I mean, just given the, the national zeitgeist, the Me Too movement, why not ask specifically about sexual misconduct? You know, we're living in a time of backlash against sexual misconduct, against NDAs. You know, why not ask specifically about it? Well, I, I, I don't at all mean to diminish the importance of sexual harassment in the workplace, which I, I take very seriously at DOI and in general. But I do think that the focus of our background investigations is primarily on corruption vulnerabilities. And our preference is to ask about any adverse information. I think if we started identifying what are all the possible things that we might want to know about before a person is in a position of public trust, I think in, in my experience, the more you identify these five specific things, the easier it is to miss things. And our preference has been over time to ask employers whether they are aware of any adverse information arising from the person's employment, which I think a fair-minded employer should include in that substantiated allegations of sexual harassment, particularly in the case, a case like Kevin O'Brien's where we know now it, re it was the cause of his departure from the National Governors Association. But I don't think that privileging sexual harassment allegations over the range of other corruption vulnerabilities that are our primary focus is, is the way to go. Yeah, I, I would recommend asking, just given the sheer, just the prevalence of sexual harassment in the workplace, um, did, did, did Mr. O'Brien lie to DOI? Um, the O'Brien case is a little bit complicated because of the 
some murkiness surrounding the exact circumstances of his departure from the National Governors Association. I think that um, a fair reading of his background investigation questionnaire would lead one to conclude that he was not truthful. Okay. So what are the consequences for lying to DOI, failing to tell the truth to DOI? Um, I would say that there's two possible consequences. Uh, one would be certainly that if we were aware that an applicant had provided false information or made material omissions, we would immediately notify the hiring agency of our conclusions. It would be up to them to decide whether the person would be terminated or otherwise disciplined. Um, and then the second consequence is a would be a possible criminal referral to, we would typically make those to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office um, for a decision on their part as to whether they thought the circumstances merited a criminal charge of perjury or filing a false instrument. Uh, is DOI going to see to it that Mr. O'Brien suffers those consequences for lying to the agency? So or? I don't want to talk about criminal referrals in any specific case, but what I can say is that DOI takes that the matter of false information on a background in the background process very seriously. And if we thought in any case, Mr. O'Brien's or any case, that the facts made out a potential perjury or filing a false instrument charge, we would make that referral um, likely to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Okay, so let's zoom out. And if you can describe just in detail the step-by-step -step process by which DOI conducts background investigations. Sure. Um, so as I said, it, the hiring agency initiates the process by identifying um, their employees who require background investigation. And it is generally the responsibility of the hiring agency to assist the applicant in gathering all of the relevant documents and s putting those into a package and sending them to DOI. Um, for for um, applicants who need to be background investigated before they can begin, um, the process is a little bit different in the sense that we often are getting those things more piecemeal, you know, notification that there is such a person, um, a schedule for when the documents might come in and so on so that we can start working right away. But for the typical applicant, the hiring agency would work with the applicant to complete the process of all forms and send a completed package to DOI. Um, and then there is a long series of sort of database checks, um, uniform accessible places of information that an investigator would check for all applicants, any that were applicable. Um, and those can include some employment history, education, um, residence in New York City if that's required, um, verifying prior residences, a huge range of things that can be checked through public databases. Sometimes we start there. Um, all applicants are fingerprinted and their criminal history is run through um, NCIC, which is the National Criminal Information Database. Um, the, the applicant is interviewed in person by a DOI investigator. Uh, that interview generally consists of going through the background investigation questionnaire, which the investigator will have reviewed in advance um, to clarify any conflicting information, ask any follow-up questions, um, fill in any places that the applicant may have neglected to fill in. Um, and then following those things, there would, for many applicants, be a series of efforts on the part of the investigator to do sort of human-to-human -human investigations, speaking with uh, near-term prior employment. Um, there are times, depending on the nature of the employment or the educational background or residency information, where additional sort of person-to-person -person checks might have to be made. And so the investigators will do that. We request verification of all um, tax filings, even if they're out of New York State, um, from the federal government and the relevant state authorities. Um, we check a variety of other places uh, in New York City and New York State to determine if the person has um, unmet financial obligations. So everything from unpaid parking tickets to tax liens to civil judgments pending. Um, for an employee who is exempt from the requirements of SCADIA, which is the Stop Credit Discrimination and Employment Act, we also do a financial workup on that applicant, including credit checks and other financial checks um, to identify whether there are financial vulnerabilities to corruption. And in, in your experience, what are the most common 
bottlenecks that delay the completion, the timely completion of a background investigation. So, so I would and say. We've, we've been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers. So. Um, I would say that uh, it would maybe is best illustrated by sort of a, a, an easy example of an easy applicant and a difficult applicant. Um, the easy applicant whose investigation can typically be completed much more quickly is someone who has always resided in New York State, even better if they've always resided in New York City, um, who received all of their education in the United States at a major educational institution, whose prior employment is generally with uh, large companies or government entities, um, and who has limited potential conflicts of interest. So. Um, they don't own any companies, they don't rent out property, they don't have a spouse or other relatives who are engaged in businesses that touch the city. Um, that would be a very straightforward application that we would, oh, and the person has no criminal history. So um, it sounds like the, the more of a history you have outside New York City or outside the United States, and the fewer ass and the more assets you have, the more complicated your background investigation. Yeah, so that. particularly challenging things are out of state tax compliance is particularly challenging. We have um, we have measures in place with the IRS and with the New York State taxing authorities that allow us to get a relatively expedited confirmation of tax compliance from those entities. If someone is a tax filer, um, you know, in Kansas or Texas or any other state. The, the time that it would take us to get confirmation of their tax compliance from that state can vary wildly. Um, if a person's prior employment is generally with smaller entities, um, businesses that, have, that no longer exist, uh, smaller nonprofits that may not have robust HR, um, all of those things can present challenges. If a person has a complicated residency history and New York City residency is part of um, the requirement for the job, that also can present. So, so what if some of those challenges prove to be unresolvable? Like, does the impasse persist, or how do you break the impasse? So one of the things we have done in the last year, which is, is new, is to uh, implement a case reviews for our background investigation unit, which hadn't, if I understand it correctly, had not really occur ever occurred in the past, um, with a deputy commissioner who's chief of investigations running those case reviews to try to do exactly what you're raising, which is identify, um, okay, so this is a case that is persisting and particular roadblocks, and to uh, identify what those roadblocks are, apply some judgment, high level judgment to the situation to determine whether um, can this matter be resolved or are we at a point where the best service to the agency would be to provide whatever information we have and inform the agency we have been unable to confirm X and please let us know if you'd like us to continue or if you're satisfied with the information that we've been able to confirm. So I think that sort of high level attention to identifying cases that are dragging um, and providing some level of judgment and responsibility to how we're gonna resolve that is another change that we have made in the last year. So how much of the backlog can be attributed to the lack of decision making about how to best break an impasse? So I, I think it's very hard um, to identify a single cause. Um, when at, at the change, uh, the last change of administration in, in 2014, there were roughly 2,000 open background cases. So it's not really fair to say that those are all backlogged because some might have just been in process in the normal course. Um, but there were approximately 2,000 open background investigations. There, when there's any new mayoral administration, there's a, a, a burst in hiring, and particularly at the high levels and agencies where um, many of those folks would be subject to background investigations. Um, so what is clear is that over the, I guess, four and a half years from the summer of 2014 to January of 2019, that the number of open cases went from about 2,000 to about 6,400. And I think it's a combination, my, my assessment is that it's a combination of factors. One is resources, that the resources that were able to reasonably keep up in the waning days of the Bloomberg administration were not adequate to 
deal with a burst in the hiring of a new that will accompany, I think, any new mayoral administration. So there were increases in applications without increases in staff, and that those problems I think snowballed because it wasn't only personnel but also um, sort of systems for keeping track and order orderliness and assigning work. It's it, I, I'm a parent, so I think of it as if, like, the systems you might have in place that can manage your family when you have one child, if you go then to having three children, those same systems and processes are not going to be adequate for household management. And I think that also happened here, that as, as the volume of applicants increased and the size of the backlog increased, that there weren't adequate systems and processes in place to address that, and, and the backlog snowballed. And I think there also were um, some management decisions made about how old cases would be handled, how difficult cases, as you've identified, would be handled. And I think that um, there was a, a culture, and, and this is a hard thing about background investigations. No one, um, you don't get praise when you do it right, right? So if the background investigations are being done thoroughly and timely, no one is, praising you for that. You, know, no, you don't get to have a press conference if you're up to date on the background investigations. It only can, you, you only get attention when it goes wrong. Mm. And so I think um, because of that, there developed somewhat of a culture of fearfulness of like, let's just not have something go wrong, um, which can lead to a sense that, well, we can only get blamed if something bad happens. So let's keep putting the hard cases to the side. Let's let older cases, which will be harder, older cases are much harder um, to deal with when you're dealing with old information. Let's just kind of ignore that. And then I think overlaid on top of that is was a lack of management attention at the highest levels of the agency to the scope of the problem. Um, you know, I, I think for me, I will say it was a shock um, to come in and, and learn the true state of the situation that we had over 6,000 files that had not been completed. Uh, in the, I guess, o over the course of the de Blasio administration, there was a, almost a two-fold expansion of DOI's workforce. Um, did any of those new resources go to the background investigation unit? No. And so even though there was an exponential growth in the city's workforce, on the scale of tens of thousands of employees, there was no commensurate increase in the background investigation unit. No, there were very modest increases in their staffing, but n not adequate to deal with the increase in city hiring, no. Your testimony pointed out that there are city agencies that conduct background investigations of their own. D to what extent are those investigations duplicative of DOI's own background checks? Um, so the, the only agency that, that does, so these things fall in a couple of different categories. So for example, Department of Corrections and NYPD that has a uniformed academy, um, DOI does not conduct the background checks at all for their uniform personnel. Uh, we only do their kind of high level civilian personnel that would fall within our existing categories. So they are doing their own, they have robust applicant investigation units and they handle that themselves. Same is true for the fire department as well. Um, then there are agencies that send their high level personnel to DOI but they also do a little bit extra themselves. And I would put DOE in that category as I mentioned. DOE is the only agency that I'm aware of that fingerprints all of their employees before they can start working because of state education regulations. Um, and so the criminal his fingerprint and criminal history portion is completed by DOE and for everyone. And then they will send to DOI for a, a normal DOI background check anyone who falls within the otherwise applicable categories. Um, what other agencies do in terms of HR function, like a, their normal hiring processes, I think is gonna vary widely in terms of just the kinds of things that any employer would do, hopefully. And, and does checks. DOI, because obviously DOI is much more expert at investigations than a run-of-the-mill city agency. 
do you have a role in shaping their background investigations and ensuring uniformity in how agencies conduct their own internal investigations? Or? So no, I mean, and I, I really would not characterize what other agencies do as investigations. I think that the agency is responsible for the practices that I would hope any employer would do. Checking the references, asking an applicant for basic information about their work history, educational history, and so on. Um, I don't believe that other agencies are doing what I would consider to be an investigation of their applicants' backgrounds. Now you said there are a, su a subset of employees. The vast majority of employees who do undergo background investigations can begin their employment before the completion of their investigation. That's right. right. Who's the sub, I guess, who belongs in the subset of employees who, who have to have a completed background investigation before commencing employment? So all agency heads and commissioner level appointments um, are background checked before they begin. Sometimes, bef sometimes we are able to do that before the appointment is publicly announced. Um, so it is common that DOI is informed in confidence for background check purposes of a pending commissioner level or agency head appointment. Um, and we try to do the background as quickly as we can. Um, the judicial appointments have to be, com their background check has to be completed before they can be officially appointed. And then there are a sort of hard to categorize other set of employees where an agency head, which would be the mayor for City Hall um, or commissioner level for other agencies, if they feel that a position is particularly sensitive, um, so that would range, you know, some agency heads want their um, chief information security officer to be completed before they begin, um, or a general counsel, or a high level person in city hall. So it, that, that's kind of a catch all category, but if, if an agency head believes a position is so sensitive that they would like the person to be cleared before uh, their background check to be completed before they begin, um, they can ask us to do that and we'll make every effort to accommodate that. But there are certainly employees who have access to sensitive systems access to sensitive information, who play a direct role in granting city benefits, whether it be zoning approvals or, or contracts, on the scale of millions of dollars, if not more. There are employees who fit into those categories who are hired well before the completion of their background check. Is that That's correct. And, and Is that a wise, like should we strive to live in a world where the completion of a background check is a precondition for hiring? Is that desirable? I think that's a policy decision that... Well, I'm asking for your guidance yeah, as a professional. I, so. um, you know, I think the range of city agencies makes it hard to have a hard and fast rule. You know, take, take the position of an ACO, a chief contracting officer for an agency. You know, there are agencies where the ACO is routinely signing off on the initial phases of contracts worth tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the contracts at that level, of course, do receive, you know, a high-level review at other places, too, at MOX, at the comptroller. Um, there are agencies where the ACO has the same title, uh, maybe similar salary, similar job description, is at an agency where this contracting scale is just nowhere near that, so they have the same authority, but we're not talking about the same amount of money. Um, so what we have done, generally, is to rely on the agency head's assessment of the sensitivity of the position. Um, I think, you know, one of the, bit, the, the issues you're identifying was for me one of the primary reasons why in assessing the backlog situation I was not content to just let's keep trying to get it down as quickly as we can working from oldest to newest because that was really perpetuating for some unknown amount of time this circumstance where we might not be completing a check for when till the person's been working for the city for two years, which struck me as just wildly unacceptable. So part of what we've done is to, at least I know that from July 1st, 2019 forward, um, there will be no background check that we do not provide adverse information to the hiring agency within six months of the time that we get the completed packet. So maybe it's you know seven months after they start at the most um, because that is kind of within a standard probationary period for employment. 
Um, in many cases, as I said, we've been that team's been hitting average days of 71 days um, to complete. So I think in many cases, if there is adverse information, we will be delivering it to the hiring agency much sooner than six months. Um, do you think there's any? Well, I'll just ask the same question, but it's slightly different. Is there any part? Because there are components of the background investigation process that are much simpler than others, that are much more important than others. Is there any part of the background investigation process that should be a precondition for employment? Even even if it's not complete, there are some components that are that can be simply done, and but that are critically important, and we would want to know the answers to those questions before we com have the the prospective hire begin employment. Um, like, so is there a middle ground between the two extremes? You know, I think it, it, it would be possible um, that if you wanted to do something like that, it, it would, I think, not be extremely difficult to have the fingerprinting and the criminal records check run before a person begins employment. That would be kind of an obvious idea where um, that the, if the agencies were willing to partner with us in doing that, I think we could accommodate that. Um, we wouldn't, you know, obviously I'm treating the backlog differently, but on a going forward basis, I think that um, that would be something that we could do, um, you know, that we could accommodate it logistically if the agencies uh, were willing to partner with us in doing that. Um, as I said, the agencies really control the, the pipeline. And so I think we often are not even aware that there's you know, an opening or an applicant has been selected for a background check eligible position until they are actually onboarded at their agency. Um, so that process is really controlled by the hiring agencies. I think um, you know, I'm certainly willing to consider the process. Well, I'm sorry, I wanna, so the agency does not submit the name to you for a background investigation until after the point of hiring? Uh, that's right, yeah. That's true for every, um, so, so even position. even if you had the capacity and the inclination to investigate the backgrounds of prospective hires before the point of employment, you couldn't do so. Right, and and I, I do not. I mean, I, I do not think that we have the capacity to do a background investigation on every prospective applicant for a position for um, for anyone who is subject to a background check. The the offer of employment for someone who, say, a commissioner level, is contingent upon successful background. And if you are going to start work beforehand, the agencies are supposed to be informing the person that they are subject to a background investigation by DOI and that their employment, continued employment, will be contingent on the results of that investigation. Remind me, what was the size of the backlog at its peak? Um, about approximately 6,400, between 64 and 6,500. And it's presently 5,600? 5,122 as of last Friday. Um, it's clear to me that you are, you're dedicated to clearing the backlog, but there's no guarantee that your successor is going to dedicate the same amount of time and energy I think what hi history has shown us that, uh, that if there's a lack of resources or even a lack of prioritization or a lack of efficient systems, a backlog could easily develop and become prohibitive, com become overwhelming. Should there be, and I suspect you're going to be resistant to this, but should there be legislative mandates, legislative requirements that background checks are completed within deadlines? Most of us have to live in worlds of deadlines. Why shouldn't something as critical as background investigations be subject to statutory deadlines? Yeah, I, so, you know, I, I, I would resist a legislative mandate regarding the backlog because I think that it's, that's, it's not susceptible to that. Um, it, it's difficult to, as you, you know better than I do, legislation is kind of a blunt instrument, and um, I think, I, I hope the backlog situation. We think it's surgical. <laughs> <but> it's <laughs> um, I, I'll just put on my lawyer hat for yeah. a minute there. Um, so I think the backlog is a situation that, that I hope will not recur, um, whether I'm the commissioner of DOI or someone else. I, I, I'm not opposed in principle to a requirement that, you know, DOI's, that DOI report to the hiring agency within six months or less. 
the results of a background investigation. I, I, I don't think that that, um, you know, I think if that's something that the committee wants to pursue, I don't have any inherent objection to that. Um, I think that, you know, as I said, I, I've said last year and, and again today, I think that I think the current circumstance is, is shameful. Um, it, it is a dereliction of DOI's responsibility to the hiring agencies and to the city as a whole. Um, and you know we're doing everything that we can to address it. You know I, I have tried to be realistic in the estimates I've given to the council. Um, you know I don't mind saying that my my personal goal is that if if I am not the DOI commissioner on January second of 2022, that the backlog would be delivered at zero to the new whoever the new commissioner is. So I, I have great hopes. I we have great people uh, in our background investigation working on this issue. I think they feel a sense of renewal and I hope tremendous support from me and my executive team um, to tackle this problem. So I, it is my fervent hope that I will not be delivering the same problem to whoever the next commissioner in DOI is. Um, so, you, so you're confident that you could complete the, um, clear the backlog within the next two years? I'm hopeful. hopeful. I, 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 well, as I guess I said, what, what kind of resources would be required to translate hope into an actual <laughs> commitment? Um, so I think that is difficult because it's difficult to assess because what we have done since last summer in terms of splitting the, you know, starting with this fresh start idea and splitting the unit into two teams is that I wanted to make sure that we were giving the going forward team all the resources that they needed to be successful in meeting this goal of no investigation taking longer than six months. So right now, I would say there's probably a slight imbalance in terms of the resources that are devoted to current versus backlog. And as we continue to onboard the 13 new lines, and as both teams kind of continue to get their feet under them, what I expect we're gonna be able to do is continue to make additional resources available to the backlog without sacrificing um, our current our goals for the current um, background investigations coming in. Um, so, you know, I'm hesitant to say, oh, if we only had another X number of people, that would do the trick because okay. I, I don't want to, um, you know, it's complicated in the city with the hiring rules. It's, if you hire people into positions, it's not as if, it, it's, it's not easy or, or maybe even right when that need is done to say, okay, thank you, you can go now. Um, that's not typically how city employment works. And so I, I'm reluctant to devote enormous amounts of resources that probably additional resources could clear it faster. Um, I think the most responsible thing is to give the reorganization efforts at least another six months um, to really be able to assess, do we have the right balance of resources to each side of this problem? Um, and continue to assess that and move resources around. So um, I think- well, why, why do you need another six? I mean, clearly the approach you're pursuing is working. You've reduced the backlog by more than a thousand cases. There's no new backlog when it comes right. to cases. Like, like you've done the experiment, it, the new approach is successful. Why, why do we need six more, six more months to assess what we know is working? Oh no, I, I mean, I'm confident that what we're doing is working, I think to your question of yeah. what would be needed to ensure that that number would be zero in January of 2022, that's the part that I think is, is hard to assess right now because I do believe that we will be able to shift some existing resources to make the number that we've achieved to date go down faster. Um, so that's why I'm reluctant to say today well, I could definitely say if we had five more or 10 But is it, more. maybe I'm oversimplifying, is it as simple as what is the average number of cases that one investigator can complete within a time frame and take that number, divide it from the backlog, and that will tell you the number of investigators you will need to complete the backlog? Yes, in the, uh, you could get an estimate by doing uh, that, yeah. Again, I'm a politician, not a mathematician, but that see, it seems straightforward. It's, you know, as you have more investigators, your, your capacity to reduce the backlog is going to increase. That's true, um, yes. So I'm just curious to know what that number is. How many, how many more employees would you need to complete the backlog within a one-year time frame and within a two-year time frame? And it could be an a temporary infusion 
of investigators who could be reallocated elsewhere once the backlog is cleared. In your testimony, you distinguished objective triggers for background investigations from subjective triggers. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the objective triggers included a salary of more than 100000 which you will increase to 125000 or 120000 uh, You're to 125000 that's right. Uh, a managerial employee, M4 or higher, procurement and zoning, IT, access to sensitive systems, and then the subjective trigger is agency discretion. No, so uh, I, would, I would characterize the objective triggers as being um, salary level and the managerial code for okay. your civil service title um, because those are truly objective. Any yeah. person looking at your PMS entry, which is the city's hiring system, would be able to identify do you fall in one of those first two categories. Um, the other categories, I characterize them as subjective because they depend upon an assessment of the employee's actual duties in practice. So um, Fair enough. the sometimes civil service title and also <laughs> office title, depending on the agency, don't necessarily to an outsider reflect what the person's actual duties and responsibilities Fair enough. are. Yeah. So those subjective categories, which include essentially ability to bind the city financially of more than $10,000, uh, contracting authority, zoning approvals, uh, certain kinds of special permit approvals, um, you know, and that, ge that bucket is generally the ability on your own signature to deliver a valuable city benefit, um, administrator level access to sensitive IT infrastructure or to places where very sensitive and valuable data is held by the city, um, and then the, the last category being agency head do, discretion. Do, you, do, you, do we know the number of background checks that fall into each of those categories? So we, I do not, okay. um, mainly because do we know the categories that are generating the highest demand for background checks at DOI? No, because we don't. Um, we currently don't separately track which category um, because sometimes, again, we're dependent on the agencies for that information, yeah. and many applicants fall into more than one category. So uh, take IT infrastructure and salary. Almost everyone who's going to have administrator level access to IT infrastructure um, given the IT pay scale, probably makes more than $125,000 yeah. a year. Maybe not, but there'll be significant overlap in those categories. Um, same thing for, you know, agency heads yeah. or commissioner. But I'm level. wondering in cases, because the backlog is not only a function of DOI having too few investigators, but in some sense conducting too many investigations, right? Should we focus DOI's minimal, r limited resources on, on the cases that, objectively require background investigations. We all agree, I suspect, that if you have a direct role in handing out a city benefit, you ought to be subject to a background investigation. If you have access to sensitive infrastructure, you ought to be subject to a background investigation. If you have a high level position of power in policy making, you ought to be subject. But if you're simply a mid-level managerial employee who has no special power, no special access to sensitive infrastructure, no special role in administering city benefits, why should you have to undergo a DOI background check? Well, I think that's one of the primary reasons why that the, the area the, of the changes I outlined, the area that I think is likely to yield the most distinction or get most directly at the problem that you've identified is changing the M code from all all M-coded civil service titles to M4 or higher. Um, many relatively low-level managers in city government have an M-code civil service title um, who do not necessarily, I think for many of those, have the kinds of discretionary authority that would suggest a, the, a corruption vulnerability. So um, when we finalize these changes and roll them out to city agencies, we will apply them to the backlog as well. Um, so that we're applying our current standards to the backlog, and I do expect that that will result in, in a one-time kind of jump reduction in the size of the backlog. Um, yeah, because I think what I want to see is 
proportionality between the investigations that DOI is conducting and the actual need, the actual corruption risk. Right. And that relationship can be distorted by a misuse of agency discretion, right? I'm, I'm wondering which agencies demand the most background investigations from DOI? Well, I think the, the two largest, the agencies that are responsible for the two highest just flat numbers um, are unsurprisingly two of the largest agencies in the city, Health and Hospitals and the Department of Education. So just on a flat number, not, not proportional to their size, on flat number, those two agencies um, are responsible for the highest number of DOI um, investigation, uh, background investigations. So, you know, there are some agencies that and do those agencies pay for those background investigations, or does it come at DOI's expense? So Health and Hospitals does pay. Okay. Um, they are non-mayoral agencies. So for non-mayoral agencies, um, for Health and Hospitals specifically, um, we have a, a memorandum of understanding with them to do their background investigations, and they make a contribution to DOI's expenses based on that MOU for their employees. But other agencies do not. So I guess should that be the model that you know every agency is entitled to a minimal standard of service from DOI when it comes to background investigations, but if you're demanding more than the norm, more than what is minimally required, the agency should be expected to pay for it. Because if I, as an agency head, suddenly decide to you know subject a whole new class of employees to DOI investigations, that's effectively an unfunded mandate on your agency that could impede the overall completion time of, for a background investigation. So, so how do we address that unfunded mandate? Um, well, I, I think my concern would be that I would not want to financially okay. disincentivize agency heads. So I, I think it is tricky. I share your concern that we want to make sure that there's a balance between the resources expended and the anti-corruption benefit that we get. And, and I think that's just good fiscal management. Um, I would not want to create a, you know, as agency head myself, I know every agency head is, uh, wishes they had more resources and is, is looking around for ways to make their budgeted money go farther. So my concern would be that I would not want to provide a financial disincentive to agency heads to send people to us to be backgrounded. Um, to me, I think you know we are, as part of this process, as I said in my testimony, I'm trying to evaluate every possible place in the system that we should be rethinking in order to address this problem. And so one of those has been to look at some agencies that send you know entire categories of certain kinds of employees to us. To me, the best way to address that is through direct conversation with those agency heads that, hey, you know, we, like, can we talk no, about not, this? Not legislation. <laughs> no, I, I, I do not there's think. There's a theme here. Right. No, no. Well, <laughs> I, I have a healthy respect for yeah. uh, the role of the council, I think. Um, I hope that that's clear. But I think that part of the issue is that the work that the city does and the work and structure of each agency just varies so tremendously that a one-size-fits-all solution is not perfect. Um, and what we're trying to do is to capture uh, to try to find a balance where we maximize that the number of people who should be backgrounded get into the pipeline yeah. without being over-inclusive and ending yeah. with a lot of work uh, that is of little yeah. benefit. Yeah, I, I just want to, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues, I just want to lay the groundwork for a post-Garnet world. <laughs> in which we can put in place ready rules. To be rid of me, Sophie? No, no, not at all. But I'm going to be gone at some point that ensure efficient use of resources and ensure that we are preventing the emergence of a backlog in the future. Um, so that that's my that's what and and I think an overzealous use of agency discretion can easily lead to a backlog without actually mitigating corruption in the city. Uh, so with that said, I we've been joined by Councilmember Salamanca, Councilmember Ayala, I know Councilmember Kalos has questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Torres. Do council members get background checks? No. Elected officials are not background checked. Do you know how many council members have served time for corruption? Off the top of my head, no. Uh, do you think council members should? 
Uh, no, I think the voters are the best check on elected officials. I think there's a conflict. There's it U.S. Constitution. Th there's Supreme United States Supreme Court law that prohibits it, but it was just w wor worth noting. Uh, chapter. Uh, so one thing I'm actually kind of nervous about is. Uh, uh, Chair Torres' concern about you leaving. So your predecessor kind of saw DOI commissioner as, as almost a, a life appointment. Uh, in fact, Chapter 34 of the Charter Section 801 says that basically you serve until you're removed. And it says, quote, the mayor may remove the commissioner upon filing in the office of the commissioner of citywide administrative services and serving upon the commissioner of investigation. The reason, therefore, in allowing such officer an opportunity to make a public explanation. The reason I know this is because we lived through this. Uh, are, are you planning to stay on for the next administration, or are you <laughs> planning to hand over a, a what some commissioners believe to be a customary mm -hmm. option for them to bring in a new person? Can you ask me that in December of 2021? <laughs> I'm asking now, but you don't have to. But, but would you agree that Chapter 34, Section 801 uh, may, may leave the discretion more in your hands than other commissioners? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, did you get a background check? Yes, I did. I got uh, three of them, actually. What were I, I'm curious now. Uh, one by DOI, one by the council, because I, I'm an advise and consent appointment, so the council did their own, the council staff did their own background check, and one um, by the mayor's office of appointments. Okay, three background checks. Uh, now, would a sealed criminal case be revealed by NCIC, and would it be a automatic disqualification? So um, the sealing laws vary a lot from state to state as to who they New apply York to. New York State cases. So in, in New York State, um, there's a new sealing law, as you probably know, that's relatively recent, within the past, I think, two years. We, we automatically seal almost everything very quickly. Um, yeah, so the um, typically in a... NCIC report, which we refer to as e-justice, that's the system that it comes, you can see that there is a seal conviction, but you can't always see what it is or what it's for, um, because the New York State sailing law doesn't apply to law enforcement purposes. So anytime there's criminal history, we have our general counsel and the legal department um, assess the circumstances of potential adverse information that relates to criminal history before we report that to the hiring agency. So. Um, the answer is it depends because we have folks in the council's office look at any criminal history reporting that leaves DOI to make sure that we are complying with the relevant New York State and New York City laws. So there are cases where somebody would have committed a crime, it would have been sealed, and you won't report it to the hiring agency. That's right. And, and even if you do, the hiring agency in many cases still has discretion about whether or not to move forward with that candidate. Yes, uh, the hiring agency always makes the ultimate decision about whether to rescind an offer or to terminate an employee. Uh, this is on topic because the topic is background checks, but uh, it, it is something that we've been working on since before I got elected. And But uh, DOI suggested that one agency in particular, the Board of Elections, a, a home of rampant patronage and um, nepotism, according to a report from your agency, should do background checks. Have they been submitting background checks uh, to you? Uh, I am not sure, but I will check and, I, and get back to you. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. But is I it possible check. to have somebody who is sitting with you in the audience send a quick email and get an answer for us before the end of this hearing? Uh, we can try. Thank you. Um, and are you the agency handling background checks for DYCD uh, related to the new state DOHMH requirements for, d for people who have contracts with DYCD who have to do background checks? So um, that is really in a, s in a somewhat separate category of right now DOI provides fingerprint services only. So the there are federal and state laws that require anyone who works with minors um, to have a criminal history check. So that the, the operational management of that issue rests at either DOHMH or ACS or DOE, depending on what type of program it is. DOI provides the actual fingerprinting and criminal history check services for um, child care providers right now through a MOU with DOHMH. What is the, what is your current backlog look like and when will that be done? So there, right now the only um, 
what I would characterize as a backlog is time to get for a child care employee to get an appointment to come into DOI to be fingerprinted. And as of Friday, the next available appointments were in, I believe, the second week of March. So it's about three weeks okay. right now to get an appointment. Once the person has been fingerprinted and we receive their results, which we receive very quickly, our current timeline is one to two days that we transmit negative results to DOHMH, and then they take it from there. So the, the only thing I would characterize as a backlog is there is some delay in getting an appointment um, to come in, but right now it's running at about three weeks. So we are actually engaged currently in discussions with DOHMH about how to make that process more efficient. Um, there are revisions to federal and parallel state laws that are gonna now require anyone in that category to be re-fingerprinted every five years, which is an enormous increase in the task. So we have been working with DOHMH and ACS to try to identify ways that we can be ready for that and, and make the process more efficient. Thank you. Before I hand it to one of my colleagues, I do want to, you know, the, the, do do the commissioners at the BOE undergo DOI background checks? So again, I'm not sure. They yeah. the the BOE is a strange um, because the BOE is something that we have a role in confirming BOE commissioners. Right, so. the BOE is a, you know is a very unusual city agency in that the parties yeah um, have parallel people that are appointed. And so as with elected officials, when um, positions are implicated by the political process, there often are different rules that apply to that. Um, so, but again, we'll find the answer and, and let you know. And just to correct some confusion, Commissioner Garnett is not leaving as Commissioner of DOI. <laughs> <So, laughs> Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you. Um, I, I asked the chair. I, I, th I, I thought you were leaving, but I'm sorry. Um, Commissioner, I, um, just a few questions. What agencies don't get a, a DOI background check? So um, the ones that come to mind immediately are that um, the agencies that have very significant uniformed services that go through an academy um, handle their own background checks for their uniform services. So Department of Corrections, NYPD, the fire department, they have applicant investigation units that clear people before they can enter the academy for their uniform services. DOI does not conduct those background checks. We do conduct background checks for um, civilian positions in those agencies that would otherwise be subject to that. So the general counsel at the Department of Corrections is subject to a DOI background check, um, but a uniform corrections officer is not. Yeah. Um, are council staff required to have a DOI background check, high level council staff? Uh, if they otherwise fall within the categories, then I believe the answer to that is yes. So it's not every member of, it's not every council staffer, but if they um, meet the salary targets or they fall within the discretionary categories, um, then they would potentially be subject because they're city employees. So we have, for example, in our own offices, we have council staff who make I guess the threshold is 100,000, or it's did you raise it's the It's currently 100,000. We intend to revise that to 125. When would that take effect, do you know? Um, I'm, I'm hoping actually to finalize that this week and send it out to agency heads. All right. So I know some council members may have staff members that are making over $100,000 in their offices. So they're subject to DOI? Uh, th yes. They're, well, they're city employees, so they should be background checked, yes. Okay. All right. Um, how many background... Uh, how many investigators do you currently have that that are responsible for background checks? So um, our current total staff um, in the background unit is um, 41. That includes, uh, we have t two of the 41 are people who have been hired and approved by OMB. They haven't actually started yet. Um, they should be starting in the next couple of weeks. That includes supervisors and some administrative staff. Um, so it's, you know, roughly, I would say, about 22 actual investigators, people doing, um, handling open caseloads. All right. Um, when an employee at one agency gets a background check and then they move to another agency, mm -hmm. does that, do they, does that background check that was originally done, uh, is that sufficient or do you have to do another one? So um, one of the things we are exploring, right, right now under the current rules, that often would trigger a new one. 
One of the things we are discussing internally and that I, I think we are likely to roll out is adopting the federal standard. So if you're a federal government employee and you get a complete background check, it's good for five years. Um, and currently we don't use that in the city, but I think that that is a system we could apply. We would still allow for discretion for agency heads that if if the transfer to a different agency involves significantly different or additional responsibilities or duties, my recommendation would be that we redo the background. But I think it is reasonable to have a period of time when a background would remain active and without requiring a new check. So currently, how um, backgrounds, they're, they're, they're good for how long? For five years? That's the policy you have here? No, currently in the city, there's no time... There, there's no, um, a closed background investigation doesn't stay valuable for any period of time. So currently, if a city employee received a background check for, let's say, an IT position at the Department of Corrections, and then they moved and had a IT position at ACS that requir also required a background, um, the HR department at ACS would likely resubmit that person. Um, to be background checked again. In 2021, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have a new mayor coming in. Um, I guess that gets a point. Well, he'll be sworn in in 2022. Should this new mayor come in and hire um, a commissioner uh, that was at the prior administration but left to the private sector and came back? Do they require uh, a new background check? Uh, yes, they would. They would. Okay. And then my my final my my last two questions is, what's the cost of a background check? The dollar amount. Um, so we don't we don't calculate that cost at DOI. There is a cost that the applicant has to pay for their fingerprints. Yes, so yes. Um, we get charged by DCJS um, and, and an FBI fee to run p folks' fingerprints. So there's a fee associated with that. I I confess I don't know the exact amount. It's about somewhere between seventy five and hundred dollars. The applicant pays that. We typically do that through a payroll deduction. Um, but that just is to cover our costs for running their fingerprints. Um, we don't charge applicants or agencies any separate fee that covers um, the portion of DOI's budget that goes to background. Um, in my view, that's a service that we are providing the city as a whole. I don't view it as a agency by agency service. I, as I said in my testimony, I think it, that is an anti-corruption service that we are providing to the city as a whole. Um, so I think it's properly included in DOI's budget. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Just a few follow-up questions. Uh, just sa same sort of line of thinking here about transitions into a new administration. Um, the You have a backlog. I think the back of the math that we had, back of the envelope math here is about so early 2022 when you'd be able to catch up, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, with the current backlog, presumably you're going to have to do a whole, you or somebody like you is going to have to do a whole new set of background checks as a new administration comes in. Deputy mayors, commissioners, ACOs, senior staff, you name it. Would, do you have a fear that that would put the backlog, in je clearing the backlog into, a into jeopardy and being that you're going to have all these new senior employees coming into, the potentially senior employees coming into the city that will then need, require their own background checks? So uh, my, my hope is that if we are able to have the backlog at zero by the time that new administration turns over, that we will have available the resources that are currently devoted to the backlog. Um, and that what I would intend to do, if I'm still the DOI commissioner, my recommendation to whoever is DOI commissioner then would be that to maintain the resource strength I in the background unit that we have now that's devoted both to the backlog and to current, because I think those resources are going to be required in order to deal with what will be the inevitable <coughs> influx of new, um, new files in 2022 um, because of a new mayoral administration. But I think that, that knowing that that circumstance is coming is why it's all the more important, I think, to be using this time, this next two years, to be aggressively addressing the backlog um, so that those same resources are available in a new mayoral administration to ensure that um, DOI can remain current with 
that even knowing there will be an influx in in applicants at that time. And, and do we have a number on in terms of how many employees we're talking about? I mean, it's so I'm potentially a hard thing to estimate here, but that we might be talking about in terms of a new administration and how many would it be looking? How, what would the add-on be to the existing caseload? Well, so I'm just going to look back. I can estimate a little bit um, that you know if you look back at I don't have all the way back to 2014 um, here, but you know, just as an example, in fiscal 2017, so from the summer of 2016 to 2017, so still you're about two years into the de Blasio administration, um, we received over 3,600 background files that fiscal year. Um, in By fiscal 19, we received 2,400, um, and I expect, I hope we'll have a little bit of a, um, that will remain stable for the next two years. So. Um, as I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think for the previous years of fiscal 15 and fiscal 16, it would have been similar to that high point, 3,600 to 4,000 oh, yeah. um, in those years. And then now back to what would be more consistent historical levels of between 2,000 and 2,500 in a year. Okay, and just clarifying your uh, the question and then the answer from earlier. Does the like the Department of Corrections Commissioner and the NYPD Commissioner do they get a background check through DOI? Yes, they do. They do. Okay, and um, are there just clarifying again? Which, which commissioner level positions would not get a DOI? All, com all commissioner everybody. Level okay. Positions do. And f final question. I, I know there was some you had mentioned earlier. There's discretion given to commissioners to be able to identify employees that they also think should go through. One, I don't know if an ACCO is required to by law. But an ACCO, well, so the only on the sort of legal yeah. requirement, yeah. At Executive Order 16 is very general. It just says that persons in the city who occupy positions of responsibility. And so since the late 70s, DOI commissioners have issued advisory memos to agency heads saying these are the people that I, the DOI commissioner, think occupy positions of responsibility within the meaning of Executive Order 16. So um, for many years, employees who have contracting authority, so they don't just work on contracts, but they can actually enter into contracts on the city's behalf, um, do have to be backgrounded. So that would include every, the ACOs at every city agency. Wh where is that list published of who, like for the DOI, where, of all, all the employee, the guidance to the administration in terms of who should be receiving a background check? So I believe it's on our website, but if it's not, I'd be happy to provide you with a copy. Um, the last memo that went to agency heads was in 2016. Um, I mentioned my testimony. We'll be, we intend to revise that, and I hope to get the new one out this week. So my, ex my intention, and now I certainly will, um, was to provide a copy of that new memo to the committee when it goes out to agency heads. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a few more questions, and then sure. we'll wrap up. Does, does DOI background investigations include a review of, of social media? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. I mean, well, I should clarify that. We, we, de we definitely do a basic uh, internet searching for everyone, and if, um, if there are public social media posts that would come within a general Google search of the person, then we would take a look at those things, yes. Right. And the process that you have delineated for me, for the public, seems to be at the mercy of and highly deferential to agencies, right? You rely on agencies to determine at some level which position should trigger a DOI background check, and you rely on agencies to submit names and background files to, to your agency. Um, and I expressed concerns earlier about the, the overuse of agency discretion. What about the opposite of problem? What about agencies that fail to submit names when they should have done so? So one of the reasons that we have and maintain the objective category yeah. of salary and managerial level is to provide some means for us to spot check or sort of audit um, the agency's compliance. And so we do that periodically. Um, and if we become aware, it sometimes happens, you know, we read the newspapers also, and uh, sometimes it will happen that we become aware through some means that an agency has not submitted someone who we think should be, and then we contact the agency and direct them to submit, oh. have the person submit a background package. Are there any notable cases, examples? 
in which an agency failed to submit a high-level person or an, a, not a sensitive position for background investigation? Um, there have been those. Okay. There have been situations in, since I have been DOI commissioner, there, there have been situations where we have had to notify agencies that um, someone should have been submitted that was not. And, and what typical, are, are you at liberty to, no, is it I'd confidential? No, I'd say that in, in a public it is, So what are the circumstances that lead to that kind of failure? Is it willfulness? Is it a failure of due diligence? Is um, I think sometimes it's a mistake on the part of uh, HR department. Someone has fallen through the cracks. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes when there's a new commissioner or agency head and they bring a lot of people with them um, and they are, are new to the role and bringing in their people that some of the normal HR processes may not be followed or be as robust. Um, this really speculation on my part. Um, what I can say is there have been instances, and when there have, we've notified the agency head or the agency's HR and directed them to have a background package submitted for the person. Um, and is th what is the purpose of the audit? Is the purpose of the audit to identify those who objectively are subject to a background investigation or those who should be backgrounded but not m might not fit neatly into the objective criteria? Is that is it both or is it more well, the former? Well, it is very difficult for us to audit the subjective categories. Yeah. Um, so whenever we do spot check, we focus on the objective categories, which we can, we can search PMS and, and find out. Um, is there anyone who is over the salary threshold or over the managerial threshold that we didn't have a background for? Um, you know, it, in our ex it has not been our experience that agencies are deliberately avoiding the background process. Um, although it's possible, th th that is not a takeaway from our experience. I don't think that agencies are deliberately avoiding the background process. I, I don't think that's a significant problem. Okay. I, I want to speak about the, a bit about the contrast between DOI and SEI, right? The, the McGovern report famously established that SEI is respons singularly responsible for the DOE, and DOI is singularly responsible for the rest of city government. Um, but the exception is background investigations. DOI handles background investigations into DOE employees. I mean, if, if SCI is the undisputed inspector general for DOE, and if SCI is responsible for whistleblower investigations and criminal investigations and admit, you know non-criminal investigations, why, why not leave it to SCI to do the background checks at DOE? I mean, why why make an ex, an arbitrary exception there? Yeah, so I you know I think why that happened is sort of lost in the mist of time. I don't know the precise reason. I think there's no there's no inherent reason why SCI, with the appropriate amount of of funding and personnel lines to do it couldn't perform that function. It, there's, no, there's no magic to it. I think if you have the appropriately experienced people, I think there's some advantage because DOI, the volume is so much greater um, in terms of citywide that there, there are efficiencies created from that experience and just having DOI be the sole place where all relevant background checks are done. Um, I, I think there's no inherent reason why that couldn't be the case, but... Um, Do you have a preference? You know, I do think there are efficiencies from having DOI's depth of experience and just citywide doing them all. Um, you know, I think there's also probably some cost savings by having everything in one place. Um, so just from an efficiency perspective, I think having it housed in a single place makes a lot of sense. I don't have a principled basis beyond that um, to keep it the way it is versus changing it. So, so we, we've spoken about reducing the backlog through with greater resources, greater prioritization, restructuring, you know, um, high level review. What, what about automation? You know, our research tells us that the National Background Investigations Bureau um, has set out to reduce the backlog through the use of automation, particularly automated record checks. Uh, is DOI planning to automate any part of the process by which background checks are undertaken? So, um, you know, I will say that we are having conversations with, you know, some vendors who provide various kinds of background services that can make parts of the process more efficient. I think those conversations are at an early stage, so 
I don't want to talk about them too much in detail here, but um, it is definitely the case that I and my executive team and our background supervisors are trying to think as creatively as possible about whether there are places that we could, through some minimal and merited expense, apply some of these kinds of tools that you're referring to to um, further reduce the backlog. So we are exploring those options, um, and I think that if we find one that we think makes sense, that would make a material difference without affecting the quality of our work, um, that we would certainly look to do it. And, and I had someone ask me about the notion of, of having background investigations conducted by a third party. Do you have, do, do you, what so are your thoughts on that? I, I guess I'd be reluctant to do, to completely outsource the process because I do think that we have a tremendous store of institutional knowledge at DOI. You know, I sign my own name to the background letters. I just would not feel confident outsourcing that entire process to a private for-profit vendor. I, I don't think that that makes the most sense. I think we do, a, the quality of the investigation is good. I think we provide a really good service to the city, notwithstanding the backlog. Um, and so while I'm certainly open to products and services that can help us be more efficient and use um, the, our budget money more efficiently, I, I don't think that outsourcing the entire task is a good idea. I want more clarity on, on staffing levels. I know you, you mentioned earlier that the background investigations unit has been split into two teams, one dedicated to managing new cases, the other dedicated to managing backlog cases. How much staff has been dedicated to managing new cases? So um, currently we have, I'm just going to turn back to my exact numbers. Um, so right now uh, we have 28 staff in the kind of new cases unit. Um, that includes supervisors and administrative um, staff as well as investigators. And is that a budgeted or actual number? That's the actual number. We have okay. one, one of those 28 has been hired and approved by OMB but hasn't actually started yet, but should start in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then currently on the back backlog only team is 13, um, which includes two supervisors and one admin and investigator. The rest are investigators. And I think, as I, as I said earlier, that as... Do you have any vacancies there? Uh, no, we have one, also there one person who has been hired and through OMB and is just awaiting a start date. So I expect. So the thirteen to includes the one vacancy. Yes, okay. um, and you know I think, as I said, as time goes on, I expect that some of the work of the backlog will be taken on either by the um, going forward team, either by actually shifting people over or having them sort of fill in the gaps by contributing to working on the backlog. And what's your target timetable for resolving new cases? Um, for every case to be resolved within six months or less with an average of open to close of less than 120 days. And what's been the actual performance? Um, so we currently have zero cases that have been open more than six months and the average since July 1 is 71 days. Um, so just to, uh, I guess, end it on a few notes. One is, would love to know the number of resources that would be required to clear the backlog within a one-year time frame and within a two-year time frame. Uh, you know, and, and this could be sent to us in the form of a letter. Um, I, I want DOI to identify components of the background in process that can be completed before the point of employment. Uh, I want DOI to, it'd be useful to know which categories are generating the most cases, if they could be tracking by category, on, on recognizing, as you pointed out, that there's overlap. Um, and it seems like there was some receptiveness to deadlines, that it's reasonable to expect DOI to report uh, information within a six-month period to agencies, did I understand you correctly? Or? Yes, I, I think that yeah. is reasonable. And, and then I'd be curious to know what is DOI's plan for um, 
regulating agency use of agent, you know, regulating agency discretion without eradicating it. Um, and then, you know, I just want to echo, urge DOI. Uh, I think it is worth asking about sexual misconduct. It is worth asking about NDAs, especially given the current climate in which we live. Um, so with that said, um, I have no further questions. I um, I, I do have the answer to Councilmember Kalos' question sure, about the yeah. Board of Elections. Yeah. So um, we do not currently background appointees to the Board of Elections. Um, they are vetted by the Mayor's Office of Appointments. Um, they do file COIB annual disclosure forms, but they are not subject to a DOI background check. Should DOI have a role in backgrounding BOE employees? Or? So uh, my understanding is that there's some history there, which I'm not fully up to speed on, so I, I'd hesitate to commit one way or another without educating myself more about the history there. Okay. Um, Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're gonna call up the next panel, Allison King from the New York City Bar. Uh, Shanae Weishman from Yafed, Naftali Moster from Yafed. Sure, um, but out of two minutes. Okay, uh, I wish the Commissioner Garnett stayed here because this is important. Um, on December 18th of 2019, the DOI and SCI released a joint report on their findings of an investigation into whether Mayor de Blasio or his team interfered in an investigation as to whether dozens of yeshivas in New York City are depriving kids of a substantially equivalent education, as was alleged by 52 yeshiva graduates and parents. The DOI and SEI reported that they had discovered that mayors, the mayor's offers, and likely the mayor himself, had indeed interfered in the investigation. According to their report, the DOE was ready to release an interim report on the investigation in the summer of 2017. That would be two years into the investigation, which is late enough, but apparently, the mayor was threatened he would lose mayoral control of the schools if he didn't agree to delay it further till April of 2018. So he agreed and instructed the DOE to hold the report. The DOI SEI report goes on to state that his delay did not have an effect on the outcome of the investigation since the interim report didn't have much to report on because the DOE had only managed to visit six yeshivas at that point. That claim seems ludicrous to me and seemed designed to protect the mayor from negative publicity. We can't ignore the context of this delay. First. The public would have had great interest and perhaps a strong reaction to a report that says, two years into the investigation, that only six yeshivas under the investigation allowed the city in. It also seems clear that the handful of schools the DOE did get to visit were not meeting substantial equivalency, and we could assume that those who, did, who refused to allow them in weren't meeting minimum standards either. During that same period, the mayor was going around telling the public at town halls and elsewhere that the yeshivas have been cooperative and that they were already working with the DOE to implement changes. Yet, in reality, most hadn't even allowed inspectors into the schools. There's also clear evidence that the delay did cause harm to the investigation and thereby to tens of thousands of children. When the city finally did release the report, a full year later, in August of 2018, the public responded strongly, as, as did the media. Um, a New York Times editorial came out and shortly af after, just weeks later, nearly all yeshivas opened their doors to the investigators. So how can you say that delaying the report didn't impact the investigation? But most glaringly, what's missing from the report is that the deal of the delay was to, release, to wait to release the report till April of 2018. That seems to have a specific aim, which is to allow Senator Simcha Felder to introduce an amendment to weaken standards for ultra-Orthodox yeshivas. That amendment was strategically lumped together with a state budget, which had to pass 
by April 1st of that year. If you can summarize and conclude. Sure. Um, we've also learned that the mayor himself was not um, investigated as part of this investigation, which is strange because the allegation appears to be that he himself was holding back the report. Furthermore, the, the investigation was started by a whistleblower within the Department of Education. That seems like an important detail that the DOI omitted, and I think the public deserves to know. I'll finish with that, that I hope that you will ask more questions of the DOI. I think you'd said that you were going to hold a hearing together with Mark Traeger, and I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, community, uh, committee members and Chair Torres. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you. My name is Shindy Weichman, and I have a son named Av. He is 13 years old in the eighth grade, and he attends a Hasidish Hasidic cheder, yeshiva, in Williamsburg called Square. In the past, he was lucky to receive some 90 minutes of basic math and reading, which never amounted to going past the third grade level. He now gets none. Zero hours, zero minutes, zero basic secular education. All the education that he currently receives is on Judaic studies given over in Yiddish. The DOI said that Mayor de Blasio's interference didn't harm the investi investigation. Well, they're wrong, because it did. And you have the proof right here in front of you. Some offer a paltry suggestion, at-home tutoring or supplemental instruction. My son gets home from school at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. There's no time for supplemental learning anymore like we have been doing in the past. And by supplemental, I'm talking basic math and reading in an attempt to get him to grade level. Let me, let me remind you of the fact that he is not getting his basic education needs met in a school that is getting state money and I have to pay for that basic right in addition to tuition. Needless to say, we have not been successful in getting Av up to grade level in any subject. It is difficult to do deep learning when there is no stability or consistency, not to mention group and environment, atmosphere, or support. If you think that's not a problem, then why aren't you offering the same for your children? I have asked for help on this matter many, many, many times. I've spoken up at pet panels, written to officials, had meetings with the people at the Department of Education. The length of time this issue has been let rot is just not okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Thank you. This is the final panel, so we will be concluding. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Traeger, I just want to acknowledge that he is joining us. So. Okay, great. Did, did I miss anyone? Do have to, can we reopen it? We're good? Okay, great. Thank you. We're now finally adjourned. <laughs>